have a seat. We want to welcome you to 360 Church this morning. If we haven't had a chance to be introduced, my name is Earl Kreps and with my wife Janet, we are the pastors here. It is Thanksgiving week, yes? We're very excited. Uh, one of the things we're excited about is we have a special presentation for our children today led by LaShawn Daly, our 360 Kids Director. So uh, if you're here with a child, you're welcome to drop that person off or maybe they've already been dropped off uh, in our 360 Kids room, which as you can see has a doormat prepared for snow and the onset of winter. Mm -hmm. So we at least have a sense of humor uh, here in California about what the weather uh, is going to be like. Uh, I am not really a big fan of holiday sermons on Sunday morning, and I've got to tell you why. I grew up as a pastor's kid, and I think I've got post-traumatic sermon disorder uh, from that, because a lot of the sermons I heard had titles like have an attitude of gratitude, kind of a greeting card, rhymey thing, or they were a little more disciplinary, like what have you forgotten to thank God for? Uh, or they were some terrible misinterpretation of the story of the pilgrims and the Native Americans, and, or uh, they were something really harsh, like Thanksgiving, more than just a turkey massacre. And and I have all these terrible memories in my head, really, so forgive me if today's a little cathartic, uh, along with, uh, just some teaching from uh, the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we've had a, a few days lately at our house where uh, <laughs> gratitude has been a little hard to come by, and it started so innocently. Uh, we decided we need to be real Californians, and so we're going to change our phone number to have a 510 area code because we're constantly asked, what is 417? And we have to say, Missouri. <laughs> and then we have to add these paragraphs about we're not really from there, we just lived there for a while, which is completely offensive to every Missourian who's ever lived. But we fixed all of that with one fell swoop, and then we went through the nightmare learning curve that is the smartphone, if you're not used to one, and trying to catch up the whole world with the fact that we're not at that number anymore. <laughs> we're still in the middle of, of all of that. And as we're, as we're wrestling through all of that, my Mac decides not to open any of the important <laughs> applications. None of them. It is not talking to me. And so I rush in to see the geniuses, which as you know is the ER of the Mac world. I love the geniuses. The geniuses are cool. And they tell me that in only three days they can tear everything out of it, reinstall it all, and they do so and, and it's healed, but it, it now comes back to me in a 2008 format, uh, which I, I'm currently using. Uh, we think our computer problems are over when Jan's computer shows us the black screen of death. Now, you know on an old PC, that's a black screen with those blocky white letters, which are your reminder that behind Windows, it's still DOS, baby. And it comes out when the thing is broken down. The hard drive is gone, or Windows is upset, or something is wrong, and, it, we, and so thinking that the way to cure this is to get a, a new, little, more modern PC. We get that, we bring it home, and it drops <laughs> offline 15 to 20 times a day. So that now goes back to the big box store from whence it came, where we also take her laptop, which is given to the big box store geeks, and they're working on that, and we're still waiting for the call on the diagnosis, in the midst of all of which our car dies and is still in our driveway as a kind of postmodern lawn ornament or something. It's a tribute to Sweden. It's an old Volvo. And so finding that the repair costs more than the car is actually worth at almost 200,000 miles, uh, we went and got another newer old Volvo to replace our original really old old Volvo. And in, in the flow of all of this, it's time for my annual physical. And the many indignities that that involves for a man my age. Even leaving aside all the poking, prodding, and stabbing, there are the humiliating questions like, are you doing this? No. Have you kept track of that? Uh, not really. <laughs> what about your diet? Uh, cheeseburgers? <laughs> and it's a humiliation ritual designed to break you down, to make you pliable to your doctor's will. And I, I found that the gratitude meter was, was, it was over towards the empty side on the old thankfulness gauge, if you know what I mean. And, uh, it brought to mind my mother's cure for this life condition. My mom had a cure for this. And it often happened, as I was sharing with the team this morning, at at dinner time. So if you would say something like, you know, <laughs> I'm just so full of stress, my mind, I can't even eat. She'd say something like, your head's full of stress, huh? Well, some people don't even have heads at all. How would you like that, mister? 
And she would then follow that with a list of countries where people were starving, like England. Like, nobody's starving in England. You're making this up. You should be grateful for what you've got. My mom's theory was, if you were mugged in an elevator, you should be grateful that at least the building you were in had an elevator, because not all buildings do. And this was her theory of how you could get over it all. Uh, what she was really trying to tell me in her wonderful maternal way, which I, I still cherish, is that gratitude is really a fragile thing. It's like a china teacup, not a cement block. And without a lot of maintenance and attention, it goes away. Especially in an environment like ours, which is very high performance, very high capacity, and in which the message that the setting sends you is, you have what you have because you deserve it. You earned it, you are special. Four blocks from a university with an 80% turndown rate, that's a pretty easy message to absorb. Jesus discovered how fragile gratitude was one day on a road trip. He was in his final journey to Jerusalem. The story is recorded in the Gospel of Luke. The passage is on the back of the program that you received when you came in today. And this passage is called the Jerusalem Journey section, and it runs about from the end of chapter 9 towards the end of chapter 19. And in it, there are about five miracles. The story we'll look at today involves one of those. He's headed for Jerusalem because he senses that the Father's timing has been fulfilled for his teaching and healing ministry to come to an end, and now he has to go to this city and face the crisis of death on the cross. With that on his mind, he's walking through Palestine and finds himself near a village where he meets 10 people who, let's just say they're not from the Chamber of Commerce. We drop into the story in Luke 17 in verse 11. It says, on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not 10 cleansed? Here's the title of 50% of the Thanksgiving sermons that I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Where are the nine? <laughs> Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Earlier in Luke's account of Jesus' life, we find that the Lord has set his face to go to Jerusalem. In other words, he has iron resolve that no matter what, he is going to this city to face the destiny that is going to secure salvation for the world for all of those who believe. And in the middle of this road trip, it's not a straight line journey. He is walking between Galilee and Samaria. Now, Galilee is the more rural Jewish area to the north of Palestine, Jesus' homeland. In the southern area is Judea, where, Ju where Jerusalem is located. That's the more urban type of area. And sandwiched in between is this kind of in the middle sort of place called Samaria. Now, the Galilean rural folk and the city folk, the red state and the blue state people, so to speak, only agreed on one thing, and that is they hated the Samaritans completely. <laughs> it's amazing what will pull people together. Hate will do it every single time. And they hated them because they were a mixture of Jewish blood and the blood of invading nations that had come over the centuries off and on, and out of this mixture, they had formulated uh, their own temple and priesthood, which to a Jewish population that felt that worship should only take in Jerusalem, well, in the ancient world, those were two solid reasons to hate. And so hate they did. Jesus, as is his way, is walking in between the two countries. This is like somebody walking through the DMZ that separates North Korea from South Korea. Do you get the image there? 
He is hating no one, loving everyone. And you know what? Haters will hate you for that. No, no wonder they killed him. He just refused to hate anybody. And so he walks in between serving both on the road to the city where the people that he serves will take his life as he voluntarily gives it up. When he approaches the city, he's not met by the Chamber of Commerce. The mayor doesn't come out to meet him. Uh, at this point, he is so controversial and resistance to him has risen so high. I think the mayor is probably hiding at his house. <laughs> And no one is going to come out to meet him because they're not clear that associating with him is really a safe thing to do. But the lepers, they have no trouble with it because the Old Testament law does not allow them to be inside the walls of the city. They are in a leper camp outside the walls of the city. Now, the scripture didn't state how far away they had to be, but there's one tradition that says it was perhaps about 150 feet. And so if this story takes place in Memorial Stadium, the gates of the city are at the goal line and the 10 lepers are at the 50. And they cry out. Since leprosy attacks the upper respiratory system, weakens the voice, it must have taken everything they could muster to say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. From the goal line, that must have sounded like <laughs> See, the law stipulated that not only did they have to keep the distance, but they had to cry out all the time, not have mercy on us. They had to cry out, hey, we're lepers, stay away, to make sure that no one came into contact with them and the disease would spread. Now, that's ironic because the word leprosy here is actually a generic term that used, is used to apply to a lot of different skin diseases. You really can't pinpoint which one it was. But it's possible that it was Hansen's disease, what you and I commonly call leprosy. Now, this is a disease caused by a bacteria, and the disease comes in two forms. There's a really severe type, which is horribly disfiguring. That's the one you've seen in the Indiana Jones movies. It's, it's unbelievably horrific for someone. And untreated, the worst part of it is that it will kill you, but in 10 or 20 years, you have to live with it if you receive no medication. There's another kind, which is much less horrific for the body and is a, a lot simpler to take care of, and it can actually cure itself in two or three years. And so the Old Testament prescribes that if a person feels they've been cleansed of it, which probably refers to type 2, Hansen's disease, mm -hmm. uh, they go to the priests, and you have to be certified as having been healed to rejoin the community. Do you know how hard it is to get leprosy? <laughs> 95% of the human race is immune to it by nature, by birth. The only documented way for a human being to be contaminated by the leprosy bacterium resulting in disease is through contact with armadillos. <laughs> so I feel we're safe here in the East Bay from, from this scourge. That's the only known way. To this day, no one really knows exactly how it happens. It's suspected that when it does happen, it's through prolonged, close contact with someone who is already infected. Even then, it's really, really tough to get it. Now, what this means is, if you are one of these 10, your theme song is, if it weren't for bad luck, baby, I'd have no luck at all. You are the most unlucky person who has ever lived. You had a 5% yeah. shot on your worst day. You either grabbed an armadillo and took it home to be a pet, or you worked cheek by jowl with someone else who already had the disease and didn't. It just almost never happened. And so when these guys are standing out there at the 50 yard line, Jesus, have mercy on us. They're not just sick or possibly disfigured. They've got to feel like they've been singled out. They've got to feel like God has put a big, heavy finger down on their life and destroyed them. Because no one else around, no one else in the village has got this. It's just a handful of them. Seeing him there, he's their only hope. And so from the 50-yard line, they croak out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When I read that, I wondered if maybe that's how my prayers sound to God now. 
you know, you use all this fancy religious language and you come up with all of these prayer formulas and you read books and all of these other things and try to pray in Elizabethan English or whatever you feel like gets the job done for you. And I wonder if in heaven it just sounds like, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. But he does not turn them away. Unlucky, diseased, exiled from the community, he does not turn his back. He doesn't touch them for what we know they're as far away as when they started. But he says to them, when he sees them go, that's an imperative word there, it's not a suggestion, it's an order, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were healed. You know, sometimes the answer we need comes when we act on the faith that we have. Now, their faith is imperfect, it's incomplete, but then, you know, so is mine. They act on it, and the healing comes on them before they reach the priest. Now, it doesn't say this in the story, but it could be that the Samaritan guy went to the priest at his place, the Methodists, and the Jewish guys went to the priest over with the Baptists. But everybody got the same healing because they acted in obedience to what Jesus had spoken to them. And somehow, through the power of God, the disease lifts from them. And the Samaritan, one out of the 10, comes to a different conclusion than the other nine does. You know, the only upside to suffering like the kind that leprosy involves is that it brings down social borders. It crushes the walls between people. When things are going badly, you will put up with anything. And so the only place, to my knowledge, where Jewish men and Samaritan men lived together in this context was leper colonies. Mm -hmm. And they are just as unable to approach Jesus as we are unable to approach God on our own. From a distance, the distance created by the alienation of sin we cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on me. You know, when we come to the end of this talk today, if you're in that place of needing mercy from God, maybe for a situation in your life or a problem or an issue, I want you to know that he's going to hear you yeah. when you cry out. That's right. Even if it's just a little croak right. from the 50-yard right. line, then other people hear that. They, the people in the village they must have laughed mm -hmm. when they heard this. Look at those lepers. Look at those fools. Taking that stipulation from the law about shouting out loud to keep people away and twisting it to make it into a kind of a request from this rabbi to do what kind of mercy? What do they want, a financial contribution? And Jesus speaks exactly the kind of mercy that they need, and he's going to speak exactly the mercy that you need today. Uh, our job isn't to earn our way into that. It's to cry out for it and simply to ask for it, and it comes just by grace from him and not by anything else. The Samaritan is so moved that he makes his way back to Jesus, throws himself down on his feet, thanks him, and is glorifying God. Jesus looks around and does the math. We started with 10. Mm -hmm. We've ended mm -hmm. with one. What's the story here? Miracles are easier than gratitude. See, the miracle dispensation was 100%. Everyone got well, but the gratitude response was 10%. Uh, now, I hate thinking like that because it makes me realize how many times in my own life God has done so much for me and I have returned thanks so little. So little. I think for me, one in ten is probably about the ratio that I lived that I read this story. And I, can't, I can't be like that. You know, I can't be like that. You know, when the computer's broken, Jesus is still at the right hand of the Father. When the car doesn't work, he still made a new and living way through the heavens into the, to the throne of grace where we can find help in time of need. When we're having health issues, when our toilet's overflowing in the back bathroom and I'm soaking it up with, with <laughs> towels and my shoes are wet, Jesus is still the son of the living God. Amen. He's still the Alpha and the Omega, the That's beginning right. and the end. None of that has changed. 
What I find is like the other nine with whom I am numbered this morning, when, when things get slightly off-centered, I, I, I begin to feel like they did. I, I'm being singled out. This is especially bad. This is, I, in other words, what I'm saying is, God, I would be grateful if you would make my life better. So I'm going to hold you hostage. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to thank you. I'm going to be grateful to you as soon as you improve my life. And once you do, then I'll come across with some love. But no better life, no love. Would you agree with me this morning that he does not negotiate? <laughs> At least he doesn't ever with me. The other night disappeared. Jesus says, where are they? You know what this says to me? I have two things about gratitude. One is this. Gratitude is not an attitude. It is a behavior. Mm -hmm. When I, I see those titles, attitude, gratitude, I think, you know, uh, I, I, I love uh, some rap music because of the, the clever rhyming in the lyrics. <laughs> Uh, do you guys know Lecrae, yeah. the yeah. Christian rap artist? Well, I've, I've been trying to get hipper. <laughs> and I understand this is a large hill to climb, okay? But while I'm uh, doing weights and on the treadmill, I listen to my, uh, my Pandora. I know that's not as cool as Spotify, but it, all right, it's good. And I'm listening to Lecrae, and I discover listening to the Lecrae channel that uh, Flipper rhymes with Jack the Ripper. Did you know that? <laughs> this is awesome. Who thinks of this stuff? Rap lyricists are the cleverest people in the world, as far as I can tell, with the use of words. I mean, it's just, I almost laughed my head off. I just love that so much. And so the, the reason why gratitude is called an attitude is because it rhymes. That's the only reason. I mean, should we, we be using the logic of greeting cards to shape our lives? I don't think so. When I look at the story here, this is not a nice thing. This is not a feel-good story. This is a spank, isn't it? And the, the reason I think that we've misinterpreted it is because when you look at what the Samaritan has done, he does something about it. He goes back and says thank you and recognizes Jesus for who he really is. See, if gratitude is just an attitude, if I'm grateful to uh, my wife, who is the best person I know, and I am grateful to her for so many things. Uh, she's gorgeous. I'm grateful for that. And she's just has all these. She's a great leader, speaker. I'm grateful for all of that. But if I just keep that in my heart and I never say it, I think the number of days I'm going to have a wife are numbered. <laughs> if it's just an attitude, if you don't verbalize it. No one knows that you're grateful. And the truth is, the psychology research shows, I think, pretty conclusively that gratitude can be cultivated by behavior. There's, just, there's no doubt about that. If, if I say that to Jan, she's going to not only hear it, but through the words which come out of the heart, she can see what's in my heart. When we come together to worship the Lord, whether individually or on a Sunday morning, and we sing, that's why we say worship out loud. You know, when you come here to do that, get your grateful on. That's you know right. what I'm saying? That's right. Just say the gratitude right out loud. Don't that's hold right. back. Don't worry about what anybody thinks or looks at you right. or what your tradition is. Right. I mean, we're going to do that our own way and in our own culture and all. We're not going to copy anything from anywhere else. But gratitude being a behavior comes out in a verbal expression. Yeah. And when it does, all the right stuff happens. Yeah. You know what? The, the literature says your blood pressure goes down. Mm. Your immune system is strong. You have greater optimism. You have great, in other words, you can lay off the five hour energy drinks if you just get more <laughs> grateful. You're going to have a, a stronger self esteem. Mm. All of the right things that can happen to your thinking about yourself and your life right. happen right. when gratitude happens and it yes. pours out of you. It changes how you think and how you act. And you know what? I, I, I'll just tell you this by observation of this over many years. Grateful people are magnetic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and influential. Mm -hmm. Because who doesn't want to be around an appreciative person? Doesn't that make sense? Mm -hmm. No wonder Jesus says, where are the nine? <laughs> He's talking to me. When I solve your problem, and your really old Volvo got replaced with a just somewhat old Volvo, you didn't say a word to me about it. 
Where are the nine? Where were you, Earl? You think I just dropped those out of the sky randomly? I was here for you. Where's the love? <laughs> it's not because God needs a love. He doesn't need anything. He knows I need it. I need that closeness. I need that, that grateful spirit. He knows not only what it will do for me, but how it will bond me to him. Gratitude is not an attitude. It is a behavior. So here's your homework. The next time someone, like the person that squirts the coffee into the cup for you at Starbucks, who actually is obligated to do that by the fact that you've paid them, the next time someone does something for you for which they were obligated to do anyway, thank them. Don't just feel good about it. Thank them. Thank you for my tall Christmas blend with no room. Thank you for my delicious, non-fat eggnog latte. Amen. Thank you for handing me the change. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Gratitude's a behavior. Gratitude is also not a platitude. Now he's a rap star. <laughs> <laughs> it's a spiritual discipline. You know what makes it a spiritual discipline? Because unlike a lot of the teaching you see on the internet about how you should be grateful or when nothing else is going right, just be glad that you're breathing. That sounds like my mom. (laughs) Don't like cabbage, you know? Some people don't have a mouth. That's not not go there at all, really. I can't, my psyche can't take it. It's not just a matter of feeling grateful. The reason gratitude is a spiritual discipline is because it has an object, the person of God. Not just gratitude as a noun, but grateful to Mm -hmm. as a verb. Mm -hmm. God is the object of our gratitude. And that that we express to other people is just the overflow of a grateful relationship with God. I'll tell you this. If you are stingy with gratitude towards people, you are probably stingy with gratitude towards God. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth, is going to speak. The good news is that can be reversed easily by the commitment to be involved in this discipline. And you know what the great spiritual benefit of it is? Like the, It's parallel to the psychological benefit of the behavior. The great spiritual benefit of gratitude is it crucifies entitlement. That's right. It crucifies the idea that I deserve this. Friends, we don't deserve anything. The lepers didn't deserve anything. Now, I'm not talking about your civil rights or your personal boundaries. I'm talking about your perspective towards life. Gratitude says, I am happy to have this tall Christmas blend. Mm. I may not hear the angels saying what I do when I drink that, but <laughs> I, this is a holy moment because I am grateful to my server who is the agent of God's grace to me in this Starbucks at this second. Thank you. And you know what? When I've thanked him or her, I've thanked God for his goodness to me. In these little things, we practice the discipline of being grateful for the big stuff. You know, the University of California, Berkeley and Cal Davis have gotten together on a project on the subject of gratitude. They are going to spend six million dollars to broaden the database of studies that we have. There are already quite a few of them out there, but to make a comprehensive database and then to develop evidence-based practices that people can use to cultivate this grateful thing because of the blood pressure, stress reduction, immune system response. I mean, it makes you a virtual superman. It's like five-hour energy on five-hour energy. I mean, it's just absolutely (laughs) dynamic. It's dynamic. It really is dynamic stuff. Uh, So $6 million is going to be spent by these two elite universities in pursuit of these research goals. Now, personally, I would have done it for five, (laughs) maybe four and a half. But $6 million. Uh, We could save them a lot of money. Because the truth is, there's nobody in this room that doesn't know how to be grateful right now. 
I'm looking in the mirror now. I think what's missing in my life on this issue is the commitment to do it. Because I tend to feel that what I get, I worked for. I'm not grateful for it because I worked hard, I earned it. And that's a really confusing place to be spiritually. And what Jesus is saying is don't be with the nine. Don't be like that. Put aside deserving and working and earning and all that other stuff that the people in the village are committed to and just be a Samaritan once in a while, will you? Big or little, just come back and say thank you. I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you would, please. And our band's going to come back. And we have a piece of homework for you right now. Uh, the band's going to lead us to just a little more worship. And I uh, just want to encourage you to just open your heart up and just thank God for his goodness to you in all the different ways, big and small. Uh, for this really special week, we're going to be able to connect with families and friends. It's going to be a wonderful week. Take some downtime. Thank God for that. I'm always grateful for that. And uh, as we have this musical vehicle, which is just kind of one way to do this, just express your heart to the Lord for whatever you're thankful for, whatever really means something to you. Little stuff is eligible. It doesn't have to be end of the world big, but little stuff really, in some ways, it kind of counts the most because it gets overlooked so often. Uh, and as we sing, uh, if today you have a, a need that you'd like to have somebody pray with you about, uh, we'll have some of our leaders to the left and the right here of our worship space, and you're welcome to come and join us uh, for some prayer time. Uh, and we wrap that up, and Matt's going to come and close.